Welcome. My name is F.S. Ijazuddin. I'm honored to have been invited to moderate this virtual Founders Day Symposium, organized by Foreman Christian College and University here at Lahore. For this privilege, I'm grateful to Dr. Jonathan Adelton, the new rector of FCC University. This symposium, as its name indicates, is to commemorate the 200th birth anniversary of Dr. Adelton's predecessor, Dr. Charles W. Foreman, the founder of this unique institution. To discuss his life, his contribution, and his brainchild, we have three eminent presenters, Dr. Yaku Bangash, Dr. Fazan Masi, and Dr. Jonathan Adelton. They will be followed by three equally distinguished discussants, Dr. Sikandar Hayat, Dr. Arfa Saida Zera, and Dr. Tahir Masood. Before I invite them to speak to you, I would like to say a few words to set the scene as it were. Dr. Charles William Foreman shared his birth year, 1821, with the famous explorer, Sir Richard Burton, who visited Karachi, by the way, in the 19th century, and Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the Church of Christ Scientist. In that same year, the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte died at St. Helena, and the Romantic poet John Keats died near the Spanish steppes in Rome. In India, the year 1821 saw the establishment of two diverse educational institutions on opposite sides of the subcontinent. The Armenian College and Philanthropic Academy in Eastern Calcutta, and in Western Pune, the Hindu College, now the Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute. They are still, like FCC, are still functioning as educational institutions. It's an interesting tradition that throughout the world, churches and cathedrals were named after saints. St. Peter's in Rome, St. Paul's in London, St. Mark's in Venice, and of course, St. Mary's almost everywhere else in the world. Whereas educational institutions celebrate the miracle of their establishment by drawing their patrilineage from the names of their founders or benefactors, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, McGill, and in Saudi Arabia recently, King Saud University in Riyadh. Closer home, to name a few, we have, of course, Aitchison College here at Lahore, Gordon College in Rawalpindi, Edwards College in Peshawar, Lawrence College in Mare, and more recently, the Ghulam Ishaq Khan Institute of Engineering Sciences and Technology in Topi, Khaibar Pakhtunkhwa. The college named after Dr. Foreman was already 83 years old when Pakistan was born in 1947. Since then, it has seen many changes as our presenters and discussants will explain. It has been located and relocated. It was nationalized and then denationalized. It has been lionized and demonized. But throughout its 157 year history, it has remained true to its mission and to its motto. Its mission to impart, to create, and disseminate knowledge, and to develop informed, ethical, and responsible citizens who are prepared and committed to learn, to lead, and to serve. During the next hour or so, our six presenters and discussants will tell you how Dr. Foreman's College has propagated knowledge without the prerequisite of conversion, and how many of its alumni have served their homeland, whatever it was, or whatever it may be, with distinction, dignity, loyalty, valor, and an enduring respect for the alma mater. I'm going to begin by inviting Dr. Yaqub Khan Bangash to make the, uh, make the first presentation. A quick introduction, Dr. Yaqub Khan Bangash is a professor of information technology at University in Lahore, where he also serves as the director for the Center for Governance and Policy. He's a BA from the University of Notre Dame in the US, and this is followed by a PhD from Oxford in the UK. His first book, A Princely Affair, Accession and Integration of Princely States in Pakistan, 
1947 to 55, appeared six years ago. It focused on the accession and integration of princely states like Bahalpur, Kharpur, Swat, amongst others, into the larger state of Pakistan. He's currently working on a history of Foreman Christian College. Today, he will be talking to you about the life of Dr. Charles Foreman. Dr. Bergesh. Thank you very much, Ajazin Saab, um, for that very uh, contextualized intro introduction uh, to Foreman. Um, and I think it's very important to know the uh, time period and the time that he was actually born in. Um, and of course, I do want to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Adelton uh, for inviting me to speak at this symposium and for reigniting uh, the interest in actually finishing uh, the history of Foreman Christian College, which I began years ago, but then you know, left FC and uh, wasn't really able to complete. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I am so appreciative that I am uh, sharing this um, panel with uh, my illustrious colleagues and uh, you know, great people like Dr. Sikandar Hayat, who I had the fortune of bringing to FC and uh, was working, working with. Um, I'm going to kind of try and do in about 10 to 12 minutes a tour de force, which is basically uh, talk about the whole life of Foreman and his legacy. Uh, of course, the idea is very, very broad. Uh, so I'm going to try and just give you some glimpses uh, from his from his life uh, and what he really wanted to do, uh, just to uh, give you a sense of what kind of a person he was, what background he came from, uh, what did he do in India, and how should we see his legacy. Uh, so of course, FC College is not the only thing that is his legacy, and and, and we will uh, we will talk about it um, also. Uh, let me just share my screen now. Uh, there we are. You can see this. Slideshow. There we are. So I hope you can all see the uh, slideshow now. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. So where was the Foreman family from? Uh, a really quick thing. Uh, this is a picture of a Puritans leaving uh, England. So the Foreman family was actually part of that uh, Puritans who left England uh, thinking that it wasn't uh, Protestant enough, wasn't, wasn't good enough for them. And they were a group of people who, who thought that they should go to the new world and uh, create a new life for themselves where they can live out their Christian values. Um, and his family left England in 1645, but initially they went to a place called Flushing in the Netherlands. Uh, now, interestingly enough, a lot of people know Flushing only with reference to Flushing Queens. Uh, but uh, this makes the connection that actually people who went from the Netherlands, from Flushing in Netherlands, actually went and settled in what is now Flushing Queens. They were there for a few years, and after that, they migrated to the to uh, what is now called the United States, and they went to a place called New Amsterdam. Again, the Dutch connection, uh, but of course, that place is now called New York. Uh, and they lived there for uh, a short time till uh, they participated in the Revolutionary War in the United States. Um, and I wanted to quote here that in the Re Revolutionary War in 1776, no less than 13 members of the Foreman family participated in it. And uh, Charles Foreman actually uh, writes uh, uh, in his autobiographical notes uh, that his father's sister uh, recalled this, and I quote, that she and her four brothers were stored away in the cellar to prevent them being injured by the bullets which flew past them on the errands of destruction from one army to the other in the Battle of Monmouth. So uh, the Foreman family, Foreman's father, uh, in fact, uh, as a small child, actually lived through the Revolutionary War and suffered through it. Uh, by the end of uh, the Revolutionary War, they moved uh, uh, to, New Jer uh, to New Jersey and then eventually uh, they moved to Kentucky and that is where the family then settled. Uh, his father then uh, married a Miss Wood, uh, a Baptist Christian, and it was in this sort of rural agricultural environment uh, that Charles William Foreman was born on the 3rd of March, 1821, the ninth of a staggering 18 children. <laughs> So you could imagine there were huge, huge families, but for perhaps all those acres of land, you know, uh, they had to uh, have lots of hands on deck, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, now, his grandson notes of his childhood years, and I quote here again, that Charles grew up, uh, grew up a vigorous youth with a strong constitution that later served him well in the rigors of the Punjab climate. Uh, so he had all his up upbringing in that rural environment, working on the farm, 
uh, and everywhere. Now, what's really fascinating in this thing is that even though his family initially were very religious, were very Puritan, by the time Foreman, uh, Charles William Foreman is actually born, uh, they are not religious at all. Uh, they are in fact irreligious uh, and they look down upon people who are very religious. But this is the time uh, that he actually has his conversion. And Foreman gets uh, very interested in kind of religion, uh, uh, most especially after the death of his father when he has to leave school and uh, come back uh, uh, to his uh, farm to work. And Foreman writes, and these are his own notes, I was fond of amusement and, and sport of every kind, but they were so short-lived and so generally followed by melancholy that life was often a burden for me. So it's this, this inner struggle uh, that he kind of, you know, suffered uh, through the, uh, his sort of uh, teenage years. And then he says, and I go on, I well remember when hearing two young men speak contemptuously of the Bible as cunningly devised fables, and how I said to them, I would give the world if I could believe as you do. Now, so you could see, again, a very irreligious kind of a background, wasn't really uh, kind of interested in it. But then, you know, and I can't go into the details here, then he got interested in uh, uh, religion uh, through talking to some uh, ministers. And that is how he actually, uh, there was this one minister called uh, Mr. L. N. Rice, and he kind of convinced him of the truth of Christianity and that is what led to his conversion. And as soon as he actually uh, converted and became a practicing Christian, the sense of Christian commitment uh, to do good in the world, that is something that uh, caught him and he really wanted to become a preacher. So he decided to become a minister, joined Center College in Kentucky in 1841, earning a, earning a bachelor's degree uh, in a quick three years by 1844. Uh, then he immediately joined, and the picture you can, you can see is uh, of Princeton Theological Seminary in 1844, graduating three years later, being ordained a minister on the 7th of July, 1847. And as someone actually said about him that, you know, his conversion was a very sincere consecration of his life to the service of God and his fellow men. And I put that quote there because I think that really defines Foreman throughout his long life. Uh, that is really what he was, a life of consecration. And this was a very religious term and he took it very deeply and very seriously to God and then to his fellow people. And that is a, that I think uh, remained his uh, kind of uh, basic motive throughout his life. Now he decides to go to India very quick, quickly because, and this is again from his uh, autobiography, that while there were many who could preach to the lost souls in America, there were exceedingly few who would preach to them in a country like India. The American Presbyterians had just set up a mission in India. They had this Lud uh, uh, mission in, in Ludhiana at that time. And therefore Foreman really wanted to participate in it. And he set off uh, to India. And it took him five months to reach Calcutta. You know, now you can just take a flight and then it's uh, less, less than a day. And at that time you had to go all through the Horn of Africa and reach India. So it took him five months to reach India. And I do want to read his uh, first impression of India. Um, of course, it's a bit, you know, listening to it 160 years down the line, it's very odd, but it's interesting because, you know, that is how a person who had never perhaps even set foot, uh, well, who had never set foot outside the US and have never perhaps seen uh, other people and the people around him, you know, makes this five month long voyage and comes to a new place where he doesn't know any, anything. And this is what he says. We had seen no land since we left New York on the 11th of August, 1847. And how different everything appeared. The planetins, the palms, the peoples, the banyans, the crows with their black heads and wings with lead colored bodies. The huge adjutant six feet or more from tip to tip is striding along the streets and doing the work of scavengers. And such crowds stretching from one side of the broad streets to, to the other, talking at the top of their voices. The women without shoes, but liberally supplied with ornaments about their feet and ankles, hands and wrists. The only garment, one piece of white cotton cloth in which the whole body was swayed. The men on the upper part of the body and the head uncovered. The Brahmanical thread hanging from one shoulder and white fine cloth wound gracefully around the waist, hanging down to the feet. Shops along the side of the street, uh, of the street in which pan, beetle, supari, fruits, trinkets, flour, meal, pulses, etc. could be purchased by passers-by without entering all looked so strange and new, but then really sold. 
So you could see the perception in Foreman uh, that he's very perceptive when he, when, he, when he comes and and kind of looks through India. And, you know, we get to know a lot about Calcutta off, off the time uh, by really just, you know, uh, going through his notes. Then in Calcutta, he decides uh, and speaks to Dr. Duff, uh, the great missionary, uh, Scottish mission, missionary, who had initiated the idea that the best idea for a missionary is to go for education, not di di directly for conversion, but to educate the people. And of course, there was a missionary zeal in there because they, they thought that uh, if you want to convert, you need to first educate. And even if people don't convert, by the end of it, you have actually given them a good education and that is service enough to both God and your fellow human beings. So he decides to join the Presbyterian mission, which at that time is in Ludhiana. And he joins uh, already the couple of people there. But this is a picture of how he actually traveled. And again, uh, the quote from him is, the usual way of travel was, was by planaquins, which were carried on men's shoulders, each set of eight men carrying the conveyance six or eight miles, three or four others carrying the luggage, the monotonous humdrum singing to encourage each other. The stages were made at night and each was accomplished in about three hours, four of them constituting a night's journey. Along the road were government rest houses, dark bungalows they were called, built for the accommodation of travelers at intervals of 10 or 12 miles. And he travels first from Calcutta to Allahabad, then Allahabad to Agra, and then Agra to Ludhiana. And it takes him you know, a considerable amount of time to actually, you know, cross all these, all these, uh, uh, all these places. And again, it's very fascinating. All his notes are rich with what he sees and how he actually reacts to what is happening in India. And at this time, he's also learning a lot about it, about India and especially the languages. So he reaches Ludhiana and then joins uh, the Ludhiana mission. And just a couple of words about the Ludhiana mission. The Ludhiana mission has been there since 1834. And by this time, what the Ludhiana mission is actually doing. It is publishing a lot in local tracks, in Urdu, in, Hindu, in uh, Hindi, what we call now Hindi, and in Punjabi. So this is the first printing press in Northern India. And the whole printing press revolution that comes uh, through to Northern India is through this Ludhiana press that, that is run by the Presbyterian missionaries. So they are very, uh, they are pioneers in the sense of bringing the printing press uh, to a public domain in Northern India. And Formal joins them and works with them uh, and uh, you know uh, works with them for a couple of years till of course in uh, March 19, uh, 1849 Punjab is annexed and Foreman decides to go with Mr. Newton who had, who, had, who had been there earlier to the Punjab and what they do immediately as soon as they reach Lahore and this this I really want to emphasize but they, they don't even preach they don't do anything the first thing they actually do is set up a school and it is set up uh, under a tree uh, with, you know, a very small number of people, uh, as he says, uh, that they had a couple of Kashmiri boys and it was under a, a tree and, uh, you know, Mr. Foreman taught the boys for four and a half hours a day and Mr. Newton 2.5 hours a day. So it was a very kind of a, a makeshift kind of an arrangement, but they wanted the entrance into the Punjab to be initiated through the lens of education and that is what they wanted their imprint and legacy uh, in the in the Punjab uh, to be, and the picture which I actually have in in the background, uh, I really wanted to kind of uh, uh, talk about this is uh, a tomb which is now actually in the railway uh, sort of uh, um, uh, area in in Mughalpara. Uh, that after the revolt of eighteen fifty seven, this is where uh, actually uh, Foreman lives. So he actually lives in a mobile tomb and again, you know, and he has to walk every day to his uh, school, uh, which is still in the old city. And I really found that fascinating because, you know, he, he kind of imbibed the whole uh, sort of, uh, you know, the Mughal sort of era. And if you see the picture, which is, which is right, right behind me that I, that, that I have put in, uh, he even has a long flowing beard that he could be kind of a Mughal courtier at that time. Now, what he does, and I just, just want to read a bit about how he manages the school, because I think that sets the tone of education in the Punjab to a dramatic degree. So by 1850, there were 36 Punjabis, three Kashmiris, seven Bengalis, 28 from the Northwestern provinces, three Afghans, and one Balochi, so, which makes a total of 80. There were, out of these 80, 55 were Hindu, 22, uh, 55 were Hindu, 22 Muslims, and three Sikhs. What's very fascinating is that none of them was a Christian. So these are not school, this, this was not a school for, for Christians or give, gave any treatment special to, to Christians. Of course, there were very few there in any case, 
but it was a school that was open for everyone and everyone was able to participate in this in this school so from day one it was a very uh, cosmopolitan you could see from kashmiris to afghans to punjabis to everyone was was there and in terms of religion it didn't discriminate at any level uh, in terms of religion and foreman was very keen that these students receive the best possible education and therefore he ordered in 1850 $600 worth of scientific apparatus and he wrote to the board secretary of the presbyterian church that if you do not give me the money i will use my own funds to buy this apparatus so again you know this great zeal of education and he really wanted these kids to be educated and he writes back when the presbyterian mission agrees for the money he says and i quote the apparatus has arrived i worked with it a good deal i wish you could have heard the wah wah which came from every part of the room when the pith figures commenced dancing under the influence of electricity you would have been very pleased the microscope and compass are beautiful instruments please send me the following articles now at my expense an astronomical telescope price 152 dollars uh, globes of low standard diameter 13 inches magic lantern etc etc so in 1850 this is the first scientific laboratory that's been set up perhaps for 100 years in the punjab and this is what foreman is actually doing out of his own own own, own pocket pushing the presbyterian missionaries to give you that kind of money and really setting up a school that sets the tone for the future uh, of education in the subcontinent now the rang mahal school you know this is the this is the claim to fame uh, that he actually does because by 1852 uh the small makeshift uh, arrangement that he had near his own house um had run its course and they wanted a proper school so the rang mahal uh which was a large palatial house of one sadullah khan of chinyot who was a prime minister during mughal emperor shah jahan's time uh, that was available and he wanted to take lease of that and the and the british government gave him a quick lease of it uh and for the first time you know i've just shown doc, dr jonathan that we have the lease documents Uh, the original the copy of the original lease documents which i just quickly show you uh, again in 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 the name of charles foreman at that time for 150 for a princely sum of course at that time for 150 rupees uh, this is you can see from 1854 uh, this is again a grant which was agreed upon and this has the uh, you know also the government sign so these are the huge kind of important moments and this is when the school becomes the most established school in the punjab the first school that teaches in english the first school that teaches uh modern science uh and interestingly enough the first high school in the in lahore uh for decades till the government actually only later sets up a school so it's so good that you know the government doesn't even uh create its own school now the first big shock that that foreman receives and i'll be really quick now is the mutiny at that time because a lot of people are affected by it some some missionaries uh, especially in sialkot are killed but foreman is spared uh, they go off uh, to the fort i just uh, uh, got a picture of the fort here uh, and they kind of uh, you know live through the mutiny there and then afterwards they come back but immediately as, as soon as they come back they reset the school so there's a small gap in the functioning of the school but as soon as the mutiny is over uh, it is set up and then foreman actually works uh to fix the school and actually increase it and you could see that by the 1860s very quick quickly uh the school has about over 15 to 1700 pupils at the same same time so you could see that it's expanded dramatically and by the 1860s it has branch schools which means feeder schools that it has throughout the city and i should men mention here two very well three very important things that make uh form and very dis dis distinctive one these schools admit everyone from every background so for example they admitted a dalit you know when a dalit which is an out outcast in hinduism was admitted a lot of parents pulled their school uh, pulled their kids out of the school foreman said no we are going to keep the dalit there if they want the kids not to turn up here we don't care so that was a revolutionary idea at that time when he allowed the entrance of dalits and kept them at the same level as everyone else second women education Uh, Mrs Newton at that time had set up a girls school which was again a pi a pioneering institution at that time because again the Punjab did not have uh women's inst 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 institutions and third very importantly was that the curriculum largely speaking was of a secular na a secular nature even though it was a mystery run school the aim was not to actually convert in fact in 1866 someone converts and the school almost shuts down so they actually say we don't really want to convert people we want to educate them that becomes uh, the main uh, kind of an idea 
And in 1864, uh, they add a college sex, sex uh, section to it, which of course by the end of it becomes uh, the Mission College. And here's a picture from 1889, the first kind of building of the Mission, Mission, Mission College. Uh, and Foreman taught there, uh, Newton taught, taught there, a couple of other uh, sort of uh, uh, professors actually taught there. And that Mission College then becomes the first uh, collegiate institution in the Punjab at this moment because there is no university in the Punjab, it is affiliated to Calcutta University. Uh, they first do the FA examinations and then they do the bachelor's examinations. Uh, and then uh, sadly in 1868, the college principal uh, uh, kind of dies and it shuts down. But at that time, Foreman is away on furlough in the, in, in, in the US. So a very in, in, interesting telegram uh, is sent uh, saying, Henry dead send Foreman. So Foreman kind of rushes back, but at that time it is not possible to resurrect the college. Uh, so it takes a decade and a, and a bit for the college to be resurrected. Uh, but meanwhile, a lot of buildings are being added to, to this. So by the time the college is re resurrected in 1886, uh, a lot of work had been done on the college. And I'll just quickly show you uh, a couple of pictures uh, of the college. Just There we are. Uh, these are the pictures. These are the oldest pictures of uh, the Mission College. Uh, on the top is the assembly hall. Then there's the main administration building. And then these are the other college pictures. We'll just come back to this. Uh, and this is how he, 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 he sets up education in the Punjab. Now, I just want to uh, end with a couple of things. Uh, I just want to quote a few people uh, when they write about Foreman. And this is a quote uh, from uh, Sir Robert Egerton, who's the, lef the Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab. And this is what he says about Foreman. I know from personal observation during that time how admirably their work has been done and how greatly the American missionaries are, res are respected. There is, but there is one amongst the revered gentlemen whose name I wish specially to mention as having most particularly devoted himself to the work of teaching. I mean the Reverend Charles W. Foreman, who has been charged of the school. I know that his national modesty of character would make him shrink from having his merits publicly noticed. He does not work for praise of man. He has worked for higher motives and the consciousness he has has been of use to his fellow men is a far better reward than any praise which I can bestow. But on occasions like these, when so many gentlemen of Johor, European and native are present, I think it is right that you should know that his exertion and his self-denying life are appreciated by those who have witnessed them. And that the society which sent him here should be made aware of the estimation in which its work and devotion of his missionaries are held in Lahore. So, you know, the great accolades that people are, are giving Foreman. But Foreman, of course, is not here just as an education missionary, he also wants to preach. So at the Fatehgarh Synod, it is decided that eventually Foreman will leave Foreman Christian College, uh, 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 the Mission College at that time, and become a full-time missionary. So in 1888, Foreman resigns as principal and uh, returns back to his job as a full-time missionary. And then he uh, eventually, of course, dies um, in 1894. Uh, on August 20, 20, 23rd, 1894. I uh, just want to quote what local newspapers said about Foreman when he died. And I want to quote the Punjab Patriot, for, for example. In the, city of Lahore and the in the city of Lahore, the people have mourned his loss as one of them. They feel that they have lost in him a real friend who felt for them and was always ready to help them. Dr. Foreman will be long remembered for the noble unselfish life that he had led throughout his long career, extended over two generations. Another newspaper said, no foreigner has ever entered the Punjab who has done so much for the Punjab as Padri Foreman Sahab. None who saw the great concourse of Hindus, Mohammedans, Christians, who gathered on that sundry August afternoon to express their love and reverence in the last solemn act of taking the body to its resting place who saw young men without regard to religion or caste carrying the coffin that contained all that was mortal of the man who had so long shown himself as their friend. Those who saw all this can never forget it or fail to give thanks to God that among men of faith, love still answers to love and faithfulness. So you could see that at his death, the great accolades that you know, came about him. So just in the final 30 second thing, what are his legacies? Two, I would want to uh, talk about. First, of course, is his 
spirituality, which I think is very integral to the setting up of the college that now bears his name. It was about serving God through his fellow men. And this is Foreman uh, Memorial Chapel, one of the places uh, at the end of uh, what is now the new Anarkali Bazaar near the Lohari Gate, where he, where, where he used to famously preach. That is now a formal chapel. So his preaching was very important to him. And that is what was central to his cause because his love of God was central to his calling. But that love of God, I would argue, kind of exhibited itself through his love of education and of his fellow man for which he devoted all his life. And you could see that after him, Sir uh, J.C.R. Hewing, uh, took up the mantle at the Mission College, which was then renamed Formal Christian College after his death and then kept flourishing. Uh, and now is, of course, this brilliant university. So I know I've taken too much time. Uh, I just realized the time now. Uh, but thank you so much for listening. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. Bangash, for this very warm and uh, affectionate introduction to this remarkable man, uh, Dr. Foreman. I'll now invite Dr. Jonathan Adelton, who is the current rector of FCCU. He spent 32 years in the US Foreign Service, during which time he served as the US ambassador to Mongolia, as the USAID representative to the European Union, and also as USAID mission director in Pakistan. He, um, in Pakistan, India, Cambodia, and Central Asia. He has a BA from Northwestern University and a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's proud to have been born, raised, and educated in the mountains of Northern Pakistan. Dr. Alton will be telling us about the larger Foreman family. Thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciate uh, the, the introduction. Also very much appreciate what we just heard about the life of Foreman. Um, I think in this symposium, we're understandably focusing on the legacy of that life uh, and also on the legacy of the institution, uh, which Dr. Farzan will speak on, on in a few minutes. Um, but when putting this together, I thought it would be interesting to do something about um, uh, the, the Foreman family. Uh, it's interesting for a, a lot of reasons. In some sense, uh, uh, the, the Charles Foreman was the, you know, part of a continuing family that went before him. But in another sense, he was the one that first came to what was then British India and started this interest that goes uh, way beyond his own lifetime, actually, and sets off other kinds of things as well uh, in terms of what happened. Um, and that, 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 that interest does continue to this day. Um, I think, for example, when I think about the family, I think about the fact that shortly after I arrived here, uh, I got a notice that there was going to be a endowed scholarship from somebody called Douglas and Ruth Foreman. And uh, digging a little bit deeper, it's the fifth generation, if you can imagine, the fifth generation from Foreman, and it will provide uh, scholarships valued at $2,400 for a Christian student and a Muslim student interested in environmental affairs. Uh, so that, you know, continues to this day. The other thing that I was really surprised about was to discover that, uh, of course, uh, Foreman had many kids. His youngest son, Hugh, um, actually passed away as recently as 1976. And you do in the math of that and you see what an, ex you know, what a, what a time period covered, how many 150 plus years, uh, you know, covered by uh, Foreman and his, uh, uh, and, and, and his children. Um, Again, when you look at the family, it's a large family. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that makes it interesting because you can go through and do some of the family tree, uh, but it was also a family that left uh, some papers behind. And uh, Dr. Bangash has looked at these papers. I've read about them. I've seen some of them. Uh, a lot of them are at the Yale Divinity School. Uh, and what's interesting is those papers are not just Foreman himself, but they go for at least three generations 
So some of the later generations also place their, their papers there. Um, what's also interesting is at least in those three generations, at least one person and often um, more than one person came back to India. So he started that five month uh, trip to Calcutta, uh, but those that followed him also, also came back. Um, he did leave uh, behind, I think Dr. Bangash has referred to it as a uh, almost 200 page handwritten diary, uh, a lot of letters. Um, and so there is something that when you look at his life, you can actually recreate, uh, um, uh, re re recreate part of it. I think that the, the, the Foreman archives is something like 15 boxes. And again, I haven't been lucky enough to look there, but some people have. Um, and, uh, you know, again, he leaves something behind and his family later adds to it. So you can find out something about what motivated him and what his life was. He himself was the ninth of 13 children. And I guess maybe expected to have a big family of his own. Uh, and in fact, he did. He, he married twice. Uh, his first wife, actually, Margaret Newton. And if that's familiar, because her, her father was a missionary, she herself was born in Ludhiana. And he had seven kids through that first wife when she passed away at the age of, of 42. Uh, we actually saw her grave this morning when we, um, uh, when we visited the, uh, the, the grave of both Charles and his first wife. And then he married again, Georgina Lockhart. Uh, interesting to me because she was born in Glasgow. Uh, born in Scotland, so there's that Scottish connection as well. And she had three more children. So there was a lot of children in that family line uh, when you look at it. And like I mentioned, um, Margaret, the first wife, uh, had grown her uh, had grown up herself, I guess in today's world, uh, we'd call it a missionary kid uh, in Liduiana. And uh, her father was actually a colleague of, um, of Foreman's as well. You look at the kids and no less than five of them came back to India. I think uh, nine of them survived into adulthood, adulthood, but uh, most of them came back to India and actually several of them worked in education. So they had the, uh, his daughter, um, Emily, she returned to India and was uh, at a girl's school. I haven't figured out where that was, but uh, she was 37 years in India, uh, remained single the rest of her life. Uh, there was uh, Mary, returned to India, headed a girl's school in Uttar Pradesh. Um, there, was, uh, there was John who became a missionary in India and spent most of his life there. Um, there was Charles who became a, quite a prominent missionary doctor. He served in India for 43 years. Um, and then there was Henry who was actually born in Lahore and uh, returned to India after his education as a Presbyterian missionary and served there until 1918. And his last assignment was to become a principal of a prominent school in Gwalar. In, uh, in, in India as well. So you think about it, uh, of those five kids that came back, three of them were in education, one of them was a doctor, um, one of them had the missionary calling, I guess, and did that as well, uh, but five of them came back, and if you add up the years, uh, a couple centuries at least of, of, of service in what was then, um, uh, what was then Br British India. Um, and again, you look at the family and where they headed. One of those kids, uh, his second wife was Constant Newton. You have this sort of intersection of the families. The Newtons keep on popping up in the, uh, uh, in the family line. Um, he actually, Henry, the son, left a fascinating biography of his father. Dr. Bangash may have seen it. It was never published. Um, but I think that's also some of the sources for his life and his, uh, um, his, 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 his legacy. Um, Again, you look at uh, one of the complicating factors is there are actually a lot of Charles W. Foremans. And I think there may be some Foremans in the family that might be listening to this or may listen to the tape. And I'm from here on out, there's a certain amount of trepidation that I might get some of the family tree confused because there's, I think, at least three Charles uh, W. Foremans that you come across. Um, but one of them was the last surviving grandson born in Gwalar in 1916, passed away as recently as 2014. And at some level, you could sort of think of him as the um, a real legacy because his whole engagement uh, was not so much as a missionary, but studying and understanding the missionary legacy in different ways. He did, in fact, come back to India uh, before partition. He taught at a seminary. I think he was headed in that direction. Uh, but after five years, he went back to the States and served and taught at Yale Divinity School uh, in 1953 for both, most, most of the rest of his life or his career. Uh, he was acting dean at that divinity school. He was active, actually, this is interesting to me, he was active in the American Civil Rights Movement. And he also taught at seminaries in Egypt and the South Pacific. Uh, in terms of his writing, he took a very strong interest in the church in the South Pacific. And so, as far as I know, he didn't leave so much behind writing about India, um, but as the grandson of, of, uh, of Charles Foreman, um, wrote a number of books, uh, and again, uh, 
was, uh, was, was, was actively involved in kind of the missionary service and interesting enough combined with the civil rights too. So in some sense, epitomizes that history that Dr. Bangash went back to the American Revolution. I think you could look through the Foreman family through that kind of lens about their association with uh, that, that history too in, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, he wasn't the only uh, later generation though to, uh, to be involved um, overseas. Another, another cousin, uh, Douglas Newton Foreman, uh, passed away in 1961, uh, another grandson of Charles W. Foreman, uh, it, it, but he returned to South Asia and was a missionary, a medical missionary uh, for 20 plus years and had a number of, uh, of, of, of medical positions afterwards. And again, these sort of twisting uh, Presbyterian missionary sagas, he married into a family that had been heavily involved in Syria and Lebanon. And of course, as many know, I call them the sister institution. Um, American University of Beirut, of course, was founded back then by Presbyterian missionaries as well. Um, and again, they, the, 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 the multiple roots as you get into the third and fourth and fifth generation get complicated. Um, but those that know my background will appreciate the fact that uh, uh, one of the great grandsons of Charles Foreman, Douglas Newton Foreman, again, that Newton name keeps on popping up, uh, but he was a foreign service officer. And he was born in India, Jalandhar, India, born in 1918, son of one of the Foreman uh, descendants who became a missionary. Uh, he himself, I guess maybe again, I sort of have an affinity to that, that became a foreign service officer and served in Beijing and Delhi and Beirut and Hong Kong. And uh, what's interesting is, of course, you on the internet, you look up and you see his obituary and what he says on his death, uh, he says that uh, any contributions should be directed toward the Foreman Christian College Scholarship Fund for Women. So this is third, three or four generations later, and there it is. Um, and uh, you know, you think about that, that legacy that started as we heard of, I think it was two or three Kashmiri boys under the tree outside uh, Texali Gate. Um, and interesting, I think that Foreman paid them one pasa each a day to attend. Uh, and you sort of see what that uh, left in, you know, set in motion. Um, partly about Foreman College, which is why we're here today, um, but a much bigger legacy. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, the Foremans truly became a Lahori family. Um, and when I think of Lahore in the, in the, in the broader context, uh, and I think about those generations that uh, they spread around the world, uh, they have an impact, but they're still Lahore is part of it. One of the quotes um, that I came up with was that apparently um, uh, Charles Foreman once said that he used, he used to say, I love the very dust of Lahore. And if that's not what a Lahore is about, I don't know what is. Um, but again, you look back and what's remarkable when you think of those descendants and there are truly dozens and dozens of them, it's no exaggeration to say that the family also came to love, if not the very dust of Lahore, the very dust of South Asia, when you think of how many uh, years they spent there. And that's South, South Asia that also includes Pakistan, uh, the, the place where Charles Foreman uh, has left a lasting mark. Uh, and a later time, I'm going to think, think about these second generation or third generation people that came back. And uh, Ajaz knows what I'm talking about when I say that, uh, because you think about Dr. Tebby, the outgoing rector, who, of course, um, uh, his father was at Foreman. Uh, and in myself, I guess I would put that because uh, second generation in that sense as well. So the sort of the dust of Lahore has its grip. It had its grip on Foreman, who started this whole thing off, uh, but you had later generations that came as well. So again, this is a little known corner, the Foreman the legacy of the family, uh, but it was my honor to speak a little bit about that and give a sense for, I think I can call it, the love that they had for South Asia. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. Adelton. Um, you've broadened our comprehension of the association over centuries between um, Dr. Charles Foreman and then his descendants. I'm reminded of um, Aitchison College when it had its centenary in 1886, uh, 1986, uh, to celebrate the centenary. Um, they invited the great granddaughter of Sir Charles Aitchison, Jean Aitchison, who was the guest of honor. And this, in a sense, parallels and bears out what you've just said, which is the continuity, the enduring continuity between <clears throat> those who served themselves and then gave their children and their grandchildren and continued that association with the subcontinent and in this case with the Punjab and with the dust of Lahore. Thank you so much indeed. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, I'll now invite Dr. Farzan Masi, who is the professor and chairman of the history department of at FCC. He has a PhD in archeology span from the University of Peshawar. He founded 
the archaeological department at the University of Punjab, and where he served as the chair for 12 years. He also worked for many years for the government of Pakistan's Department of Archaeology and Museum, serving as the director of Harappa Museum and later curator of the Lahore Fort. His publications include books on archaeology in southern Punjab and Hindu temples in the Salt Range. He will be speaking about FCC as an institution. Dr. Fazan Masi. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I will directly come to my topic, FCC and its uh, legacy. Well, in addition to well, in, in addition to a very brief uh, introduction, I have divided my presentation into two modules. Uh, well, number one, a legacy of FCC in the context of its history. And number two is legacy of FCC in the context of its uh, motto. The most important legacy of FCC is its graduates from all over the country standing for FCC in every nook and cranny of the world. Some of them reached to the positions of the president and prime ministers of Pakistan, governors, defense ministers, chief of army, and Supreme Court justices. But FCC has also a sole distinction for being an alma mater of officer Mia Abdul Rashid the first Chief Justice of Pakistan who administered the oath from Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah as the first Governor General of Pakistan. FCC has always been a centerpiece of the education system in Punjab province, even when it was taking shape under the trees of the courtyard, courtyard of Sardar Aji Singh Haveli. This unusual an unprecedented initiative taken by the Reverend Dr. Foreman was the clear deviation from the traditional education practices and laying down a cornerstone of the modern and English medium education system in today's Pakistan. When Reverend Newton and the Reverend Foreman arrived in Lahore in 1849, and they were looking for the support of the civil and military officials for their education activities. Sir Henry Lawrence, the then president of Board of Administration and God-fearing Christian British officer managed to seek approval of the Governor General and a sum of rupees 4,238 was allocated for their educational work plan. On December 19, 1849, a small mission school was started with three students in Sardar Ajit Singh Haveli under a tree with the courage and financial support of the British officers. And the student had to be paid a pesa induced to induce them to study. Well, uh, this is uh, Sardar Ajit Singh's uh, Haveli. And this is somewhere here in the courtyard of this building, uh, Dr. Foreman started classes under the trees and which later on proved to be a cornerstone of today's FCC. And today, currently this uh, building is used as a, a Tahsil building in the district court. In 1850, the newborn school moved to Swal Chapel outside the wall, now known as Foreman Memorial Chapel. And after three months, uh, the student increased to 57. Well, enrollment grew and uh, it, the need was felt to arrange a spacious place for the school. So the old Rang Mahal Palace, formerly the property of Sayyidullah Khan Chaniyoti, the Grand Wazir of Emperor Shah Jahan was purchased in 1852. The school was shifted from chapel to this Rang Mahal Palace. In 1965, the enrollment of students had reached to 750 students. Well, uh, this is uh, uh, the Rang Mahal Palace, and now you can see it is no more palace. It is just a government Mahal High School. In 1864, after 14 years, the college section was started in the Rang Mahal with three Kashmiri students. And this was the beginning of the present 
a four-man uh, Christian college. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Dr. Foreman had to return to US in 1866 on account of his bad health. Reverend Alexander Henry came from Ghana to take charge of the college. Uh, but unfortunately, Reverend Henry also died in just 1869 uh, uh, because of the sudden attack of the cholera, and the college was closed. And it remained closed for the next 70 years. And indeed, the mission has no intention at all to resume the college section. Well, at this point, the role of Mr. Mecca, one of the missionaries from the Diana, is not to be forgotten. During a meeting of the mission held at Lahore in 1885 in a building known as Baitullah, uh, this building is a point of origin of today's Nolakha Church. Uh, Mr. Mecca sent forth the reason for establishing the church college in Lahore. He spoke with such clearance and force as to carry with, as to carry every member of the mission with him. As a result, college section was reopened in 1886 in the dark back room of Rangmal with 15 students. And at this point, Dr. Foreman was unanimously appointed as the principal of the college. In 1888, a Change occurred at the top uh, when Principal Dr. Foreman relinquished the principalship in favor of Dr. James C. Ewing. And this was the time when first BE classes were organized and college was, college was shifted to a rented house opposite to Melaram Mill at, the, at uh, Melaram Street. It is close to Data Darbar. And you see, uh, well, uh, you see, th th this is. This is Melaram Street, and I went there to see it, and I asked about the Melaram uh, Mill, and I was told that it was somewhere here. So if Mill was here, so then somewhere here, in the opposite of the mill, the house was rented uh, to start the college section and to start the VA classes. The accommodation at Melaram Street again proved to be inadequate and a few months later, the college moved to a hired bungalow on Fort Road, owned by Mrs. Arathur, situated within the, within the premises of Dea Anand Anglo Vedic College. In 1955, the college building was acquired by Anjumna Hamayat Islam, and new name of Islamia College, civil line was given to this college. But the student body was continued to grow and to meet, to meet the needs. The mission college was required to be reconstructed in both fundamental and radical ways. The college authorities wanted to purchase land for college on Robert Road in, in the area which is now called Nila Gumbad. But, uh, but there was a great deal of opposition by the British uh, officer. But Sir Charles Aitchison, the then Lieutenant Governor, and a friend of Mission College played a key role in this regard. And he insisted that the land be given and also uh, made a grant of rupees 30,000 for the construction of the building. Well, uh, this is the new uh, college building on the Robert Road. Uh, and it was opened uh, on April 9, 18. Uh, 89 uh, by the Governor of India. And this building complex was now consisting of the main building with halls, offices, and the lecture rooms capable of accommodating 800 students, library and seminars also. Well, uh, this is this building, of course, is a beautiful combination and a synthesis of uh, the British and the indigenous architecture and element, architectural element and decorative designs. Well, Kennedy College was added in 1899 and the Newton Hall was built on the Napier Road in 1902. And this is the Newton Hall and on the top is still you can find there is a written a Newton Hall built in 1902. 
This is another view of the beautiful uh, buildings of the FCC and the beautiful blend of uh, the Western and the indigenous architecture style. Well, Dr. Fomer, you uh, see, he died on 27th August 1894. And just after one day on the request of the board of directors, the college was officially named as uh, Foreman the Christian College. The demand for the college education was increasing, increasing rapidly. And keeping in view the future of need, Dr. Lotus required 200 acres costing rupees 2,22,000 in 1929 on the present premises for a residential college. And the task of the building, the new campus was taken in hand in 1938. The campus was planned as a complete small modern city having its road, electricity, water supply, and sewerage disposal system. The college moved to this new campus, I mean, at the present location in 1930. A big transition, and FC College is a chartered university since 2003, and this is the first and the only liberal arts university in Pakistan. And if coming to relatively this year, the motto, Susi, so this uh, the motto by love, serve, and by love, serve, and by love, serve one another. Uh, is basically taken from the book of Palatium, chapter 5, verse 13. And this motto was adopted by Dr. Foreman in 1886, and it is a mirror of FCC's vision, goal, values, and priorities. FCC is firmly adhering to its motto from the day of its day of inception and has been demonstrating it time and again. At the time of the partition of the subcontinent in 1947, the boundary award was delayed and writing was most rampant in the Punjab. Injured refugees were coming from the Balka border to Lahore and there was no arrangement at all for the medical care of the sick, injured, old men and women. But in this worst situation, FCC converted its two hostels uh, West Hall, this is beautiful West Hall, and North Hall, now it is known as Shirazi Hall, uh, into hospital to provide them a medical care. It continued to providing health care till 1964, when it was shifted to its present location near the Liberty Chow. In line with the motto and tradition of FCC, the financial aid office is providing an unprecedented financial support to students. During the last 10 years, financial aid office transformed the lives of 21,300 students by awarding scholarship equal to 1.3 billion Pakistani rupees. Additionally, Zakat Fund, Christian Student Support Fund, Work Study Program, the tradition of TAs, RAs, and now COVID-19 Fund are other platforms for the financial assistance of the students. Roman Christian College is rightly proud of its distinct history and tradition, consistently celebrating religious tolerance, cultural diversity, academic excellence, and outstanding educational opportunities for more than 150 years. FCC is preparing students to be literal, informed, and reasoning students who are playing a vital role in building the pluralistic Pakistan society into a nation. I think this is a very important role which uh, FCC is playing. FCC has been consistently upholding the core principles of the motto for the last 150 years and affirms values such as openness, respect, and justice. Today, this core value by love, so one another has an essential, pro has an essential place in the fabric of our FCC community, for which it deserves a big round of applause. And before I say thank you, this is a humble proposal. I think there should be a formal museum at FCC. 
And at initial stages, I think there should be two galleries, uh, if, if possible, in student center. And the gallery, one, it, well, our, we, we can display their archival material related to FCC history, along with the digital, you see, digitalized material. And then in gallery two, we can depict the story of the heroes of FCC, their photographs, their biographies, and their contribution for the FCC. And with this, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Masi, uh, for a fascinating um, uh, overview of the development of uh, FC College. Um, uh, the college has grown over the centuries and um, I think everybody associated with that growth uh, is proud of um, the institution. I'm now embarrassed and humbled to introduce Dr. Arfa Saida Zera. She's a professor of history at FCC College, and it's entirely appropriate that she, as a person of the companion gender, should be present at this symposium. Dr. Arfa Saida Zera will be pleased to know that, in fact, it was in 1902 that the first woman was enrolled in the then formal Christian college. Dr. Arfa Sayyada Zera is brilliantly bilingual. She has an MA in Urdu from the University of Punjab and her PhD is from the University of Hawaii. During her distinguished academic career, she has taught at the Lahore University of Management Sciences, National College of Arts, and with probably questionable effect, senior bureaucrats at the National School of Public Policy. He's been chair of the National Commission on the Status of Women and a member of the Punjab Public Service Commission. She's the first of our discussants. And now I give the floor reluctantly with the great admiration to Dr. Arfa Sayyida Zera. I'm sorry after that introduction that Peer Sahib gave me, I forgot to unmute myself. It was enough to, to make me mum. I'm really very grateful for all this uh, introduction, which I assure you I don't deserve. After all these very expensive, very detailed uh, discussions, deliberation on Charles W. Foreman's life and his work. I, as a very humble student of history, would like to uh, bring him to the perspective of the history when he came to the subcontinent. 19th century is a intriguingly very interesting century. The world was coming to grips with new ways. And among those new ways, the first one was to change the economic viability through colonization. This expansionism then started changing the definition of the colonized civilizations and colonized cultures. So the land of promise was being captured by the people of power. But there were people of heart, people of mission, people of vision, who thought that when po political powers are captured, the common man should not be left alone to suffer. So they came basically in this era of uh, disruption, turmoil, while it was changing the meaning of life for the powerless. And their belief was that God has never abandoned the world completely. There are always certain people of God 
who will stand for those who may be the children of a lesser God, but who deserve a better deal in life. Charles W. Foreman ranks among them. And it makes me so happy to connect that he's a contemporary to our great grand old man, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, whose uh, dates are 1817 to 1898. And both have only one mission, to stir the imagination, to understand the changing times. Sometimes we think the traditions are our greatest power and they will steer us through. But I think Sir Sayed and same, I can say with confidence for Foreman, that they thought that let subcontinent be a land of charm and lure for those who wish to control its resources. But let subcontinent be a land of lure and charm for those who wish to capture its futuristic considerations. And they thought that the human resources have to develop better than the political powers can develop uh, mundane physical material resources. People like Charles W. Foreman, whom I was first introduced as I was telling Dr. Edilton this morning in 1952, when my father took us to uh, pay our tribute to an honor to Allama Iqbal, and then he brought us to this graveyard and tell us about Dr. Foreman and about Christian Foreman Christian College. And I have a little more interesting story to say, but that I'm saving till I say it to the last. And I know I have only five to seven minutes for this, uh, for this, uh, some, some comments. I was mentioning that the sensitive minds always find it that individual endeavor is never, never effort less never meaningless, and it means better social development than the development in the economic uh, ways of life. The, both of these people, when I think of Foreman and I think of Sir Sayer, they had a mission, and more than a mission, as I said earlier, a vision that a, how future can be changed. Past was gone. Present is just temporary, future has to be built. And they thought future can only be built through education, enlightening the minds, kindling the thoughts, fighting the depression. And they wished to nourish the young minds. And more than that, they wished to quench their thirsty souls thirsty souls for the realization of the self. And education for very humble students like me is not a mean of getting certificates. It is basically to realize one's self-worth, how you can contribute towards not only developing yourself, but selflessly developing the community, the society, and then at large, the uh, country that you are there. Today, when I have a good fortune to, to teach in FC College, I find it that here in the beginning, religion was not a philosophy. It was not only to convert. It was basically the ethics of religion that came to their rescue. How you really, being a man of a God, reach to the people of the God. And ethics has only one value, which, which is sustainable throughout all the times. And that is ethics to serve. 
and service is never for a moment. Service continues from one person to other, from one generation to other, from one time to another. And that is when you start taking the stock of the past and you think that is the stock of the experience, then you can build your future better. For Furman, for Sir Sayyid, the debate was Western versus modern. They were preparing people for a modern life. And a modern life meant to accepting challenges of the times through knowledge, through education. And they, through that education, Foreman gave us one great idea, that grow to serve. Have a song in your heart. Have an idea in your head. Kindle your soul, not for short-term purposes, for long-term. It might have started at a very humble beginning, but today the Foreman College University makes us to believe that a gentleman who lived a Spartan life, but with what a fertile mind and unbending courage, a servant of God put himself for the service to God's people. This is not the cult of personality as we are used to now. This is the ideal of keeping the flame burning. And the flame only burns when you know something. Thank you so very much for your kind. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. Arfa Sigida Zera. You never fail, you never disappoint. And you're always such an inspiration to listen to and to learn from. Thank you so much. Deeply grateful to you for your contribution. I think at this point, going back to what Dr. Jonathan um, Adelton had said, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that the great grandson of Dr. Charles Foreman is also listening in on this broadcast. So welcome to you, the fourth generation of Foremans, Foremanites. I'll now invite Dr. Sikandar Hayat, who is the Distinguished Professor of History and Public Policy and Dean of Faculty of so and Social Sciences at FCC. He has an MPhil in Political Science from Columbia University, New York, and a PhD in History from Qaidi Azam University, Islamabad. He taught for many years at Qaidi Azam University where he founded the Department of Pakistan Studies. He was later posted as education counselor at the Pakistan Embassy in Washington, DC, and later served as my colleague in the National Management College where he was the director of research. His area of expertise is the Pakistan movement and the role of Qaidi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. His definitive study of the Qaid appeared first in 2008 and has been reprinted since under the title, The Charismatic Leader, Qaidi Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and the Creation of Pakistan. Dr. Sikandar Hayat. Thank you so much, Fakir, sir, uh, for your generous introduction. And in fact, if I may remind my listeners, you were kind enough to write the first review on that book, which was published in Dawn, and it's still a great honor for me. And of course, another review came from my dear friend, Dr. Yakub Bangash, too. So I'm grateful to both of you. My brief remarks today as a discussant are inspired by an extraordinary educationist and scholar, Dr. Charles W. Foreman, 1821, 1894. Today on 3rd March, 2021, we are celebrating 20th anniversary of his birth. He was a Presbyterian minister, missionary, and founder of Foreman Christian College, presently a chartered university here in Lahore, where I'm fortunate enough, thanks to Dr. Yaku Bangash, to teach and serve as Dean Social Sciences. The college, of course, was named of uh, Foreman Christian College afterwards, after his death in 1894. 
we have already heard about fascinating aspects of life, career, and contributions from Dr. Adelton, Dr. Yaku, Dr. Farzan, and Dr. Arfa, and I could not agree more with them. I hope that this that his primary educational purpose will be preserved, promoted, and developed for the future. For it will be as much needed as it is now. In the short time at my disposal, five to seven minutes, I can't help as a student of history, like my worthy colleague and friend, Dr. Arfa, but to draw a brief comparison of his contributions with that of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, 1817, 1898, another extraordinary educationist, his contemporary with regard to their distinct achievement, their colleges both set up with a missionary zeal. Indeed, it will be a tale of two colleges, so to speak. Both Dr. Foreman and Sayyid Ahmed Khan started with the school and ended up with a college, both eventually becoming universities. In the case of Dr. Foreman, college section was added to the school in 1864. In case of Sayyid Ahmed Khan, the college came up in 1875, known as Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, MAO, later Aligarh College. Foreman Christian College was, of course, not named after Dr. Foreman until after his death in 1894. Originally, it was Lahore Mission College. Both colleges, in spite of their Christian and Muslim foundations, emphasized interreligious harmony. Both colleges were not elitist or class caste structured although both assumed superiority of Western knowledge and English education. Both stressed the primacy of science, but both made room for traditional learning, native vernacular languages. Both valued transformation and change. Both pushed for social uplift and betterment of society. Both promoted ethical values in teaching and conduct. Both attracted students from the length and breadth of the country and hence had a diverse student body comprising all religions, castes, creeds, and social status. More importantly, both colleges, Foreman Christian College and Aligarh College, went on to grow and develop into the breeding ground of middle classes, producing in particular educated urban middle classes, professionals, and government servants. Both colleges realized that Western education was required for government service. Both made contributions towards the creation of a class of rulers public representatives and political leaders. While Aligarh produced a host of Muslim leaders with a footing in both Western and Muslim cultures and endowed eventually with nationalist consciousness leading up to the demand and the creation of Pakistan. Foreman Christian College after 1947 went on to do more and provide leaders and leadership at all levels to Pakistan, from presidents, prime ministers, governors, chief ministers, justices, ambassadors, to journalists. This elitist profile obviously was the unintended consequences of an education meant primarily for ordinary people, for people who were poor coming from poor families. But then both colleges provided valuable resources and support to all to advance and make the most of the educational opportunities 
for their betterment, welfare, and prosperity. Foreman Christian College University, even today, is committed to this purpose and goal, thanks to Dr. Foreman's invaluable and enduring service to the cause of education in this part of the world, moving with, the, with its motto, quote, by love, serve one another, unquote. Thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. Sikandar Hayatsa. Um, listeners will understand why he is one of our most preeminent historians. You are something of which uh, um, an, an achievement of which our entire country is proud. Our third and last uh, discussant is Dr. Tahir Masood. He's a professor of Urdu at FCC, where he served for more than 16 years. Previously, he was instructor in the Urdu language department at Government College of Commerce in Gujarawala, where he taught for 14 years. He has an MA from the Punjab University in Lahore. And his publications including, include a series of interesting articles on the Urdu writings of Charles W. Foreman. He, I understand, will be speaking in Urdu. And for those of you who do not understand Urdu, I'll remind you that Dr. Foreman did, and he spoke it. So over to you, Dr. Tahir Masood. Thank you, Dr. Ijazuddin Sahib. I'm very thankful for Dr. Adelton that he wanted to share with me this symposium. और जितने भी स्कॉलर्स ने अपनी राय दी है वो यकीनन बहुत कदर के लायक है और मैं उर्दू के हवाले से चुके डॉक्टर फॉर्मन की خدمات पर बात करना चाहूंगा तो मैं नहीं चाहता कि कोई उसमें रिपीटेशन हो तो मैं डायरेक्टली इस मौजू पर आऊंगा कि डॉक्टर फॉर्मन उर्दू जुबान और अदब के अजीम मददात معروف مورخ और मशर की जुबानों के मुअल्लिम मौलवी नूर अहमद चिश्ती की रहनुमाई में उन्होंने मुख्तसर से दौरानिए में उर्दू जुबान में खूब महारत हासिल की चुनाचे 1873 ईस्वी में हुकूमत पंजाब ने उन्हें कमेटी बनाए उर्दू दर्सी कुतुब का सीनियर रुकन मुकरर किया पंजाब में 45 साल क्याम के दौरान डॉक्टर फार्मर ने समाजी और इल्मी और मजहबी मौजूदात पर उर्दू जुबान में बहुत सी कुतब तसनीफ की यहां मैं उर्दू जुबान में लिखी गई डॉक्टर फार्मन की सिर्फ उन तहरीरों का जिक्र करूंगा जिनकी अशात के شواہد دستیاب ہیں پہلے نمبر پہ ہے ذکر اسٹیفن جو 1867 میں شائع ہوئی اور یہ لدھیانہ پریس سے زیادہ تر ڈاکٹر فارمن کا کام شائع ہوا نمبر دو ہے التماس 1868 میں شائع ہوئی राह ए सलामत 1868 में शाया हुई उम्मीद जन्नत 1868 में शाया हुई शहर गाह ए दार इंग्लिस्तान 1868 में शाया हुई कशफ ए जुर्म आदम 1870 में शाया हुई पालूस का किस्सा 1870 में शाया हुई और इसी तरह कुल उनकी 19 किताबें हैं जो उर्दू जुबान में शाया हुई अगर हम इनका जायजा लें तो डॉक्टर फॉर्मेन की दिलचस्पी उर्दू जुबान से वाजे तौर पे नजर आती है कि 1867 से लेकर 1870 ईस्वी तक के 11 साल दौर में उनकी कुल 25 तसानीफ मंजरे आम पर आईं लेकिन उनमें एक पंजाबी जुबान की है दो हिंदी जुबान की है तीन अरबी जुबान में शाया हुई और 19 किताबें उर्दू जुबान में शाया हुई तो इस तरह से अददी लिहाज से भी देखें तो डॉक्टर फॉर्मन का रुझान उर्दू जुबान की तरफ वाजे तौर पे हमें नजर आता है डॉक्टर फॉर्मन की शख्सियत को अगर मैं देखूं तो मुझे यूं महसूस होता है कि जैसे वो उन लोगों में शामिल हैं जिन्होंने इंसानियत की मेराज को छू लिया था उल्फत और मोहब्बत उनका शियार था वो इंसानों के दिलों में जगह पाना जानते थे 19वीं सदी में जब डॉक्टर फार्मन लाहौर में 
خدمات انجام دے رہے تھے تقریباً اسی زمانے میں پورے برے صغیر میں مذہب کی بنیاد پر ایک دوسرے کو نیچا دکھانے کی ہوا چل رہی تھی جرمن پادری کارل فنڈر ہوں ڈاکٹر اسپرنگر ہوں یا ولیم میور ان میں سے کوئی بھی ماندانہ و مخالفانہ رویوں کے اظہار سے خود کو بچا نہ سکا مولانا رحمۃ اللہ کرانوی نے فنڈر کا رد پیش کیا سر سید نے ولیم میور کے جواب میں خطبات احمدیہ تصنیف کی ڈپٹی نذیر احمد نے فنڈر کے جواب میں امہات الامہ لکھی لیکن خود کو کفر کے فتووں سے نہ بچا پائے اس ماحول میں ڈاکٹر فارمن پورے خلوص اور نیک نیتی سے انسانیت کی خدمت اعلیٰ ظرفی سے انجام دیتے رہے انہوں نے بھی اردو میں دینی اور علمی و ادبی موضوعات پر قلم اٹھایا لیکن کسی کی دل شکنی نہیں کی اور نہ ہی کسی کو ان کی کسی کتاب کا رد لکھنے یا جواب دینے کی ضرورت محسوس ہوئی انہوں نے رسالہ بیان فارکلیت میں جو انہوں نے اٹھارہ سو پچہتر میں لکھا فارکلیت کی بحث کو موضوع بنایا جسے ایک طرح سے نبی اکرم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی بیسس سے متعلق بشارتیں سمجھنا چاہیے ڈاکٹر فارمن اسی محبت کا جذبہ جو ہے ایف سی کالج کے موٹو کے ذریعے بھی ظاہر کرتے ہیں یعنی اس موٹو سے بھی ان کی محبت عیاں ہوتی ہے بائی لو سر ون این ادر یہ صرف کالج کا موٹو ہی نہیں بلکہ ڈاکٹر چارلس ڈبلیو فورمین کی سوچ کا محور اور طرز حیات بھی ہے تو اس کے علاوہ میں خواہ جو ہے ڈاکٹر فرزن نے ایک تجویز پیش کی ہے جو میں بھی پیش کرنا چاہتا ہوں ایک تو میں ان کی تائید کرتا ہوں اور دوسرے میں یہ بتانا چاہتا ہوں کہ منی آرکائیوس کی تجویز ڈاکٹر فارمن کی کتاب جو اٹھارہ سو ستتر میں انہوں نے لکھی تھی اور اس کا نام ہے طریقہ تحقیق یعنی وہ صداقت اور سچائی کے حصول کے لیے ریسرچ کو بہت ضروری سمجھتے تھے ہم جو اسکالر آج یہاں پہ اکٹھے ہوئے ہیں اگر ہم اپنی تحریروں کو اعتبار دینا چاہتے ہیں تو ہمیں ایسا میٹیریل ایک منی آرکائیوس کی صورت میں دنیا بھر سے کالج کے اندر سے کالج کے باہر سے ایک مقام پہ اکٹھا کرنا ہوگا تاکہ جو بات ہم کہیں وہ سینہ بسینہ چلنے والی نہ ہو بلکہ تحقیق کی بنیاد پر سامنے آئے تو ڈاکٹر ایڈلٹن سے گزارش ہے کہ وہ اس پرپوزل پر ضرور غور فرمائیں بہت شکریہ جی جنہوں نے اتنی خوبصورتی خوبصورت گفتگو کی ہے اباؤٹ ڈاکٹر فومس الٹرنیٹ انٹرسٹ ان لینگویج اینڈ ان دی لنگوسٹک آسپیکٹس آف ایجوکیشن دس بین ونڈرفل ونڈرفلی اسٹیمولیٹنگ سیشن اینڈ آئی کوڈنٹ کنکلوڈ ود آؤٹ ریفرنگ ٹو ان ادر انسٹیٹیوشن وچ از دی آ خان یونیورسٹی I mention this in an elliptical way because when I was the principal of Aitchison College, one of the boys went to the Arkhan University and when he returned after the first term, I asked him, well, what did they teach you? Uh, did they teach you physiology? Did they teach you, um, you know, pharmacology? What, what were the subjects in your first term? Oh, he said they taught us art, they taught us civics, they taught us ethics, and they asked us to learn one language. So I said, but no medicine? And he said, no, 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 none. So um, I said, but why? And the answer that the faculty gave all the students was, we have four years in which to make a doctor out of you. We have only three months in which to make a human being out of you. And so if I apply that analogy to the past 157 years of Foreman Christian College's existence, they have made not simply educated professionals, Pakistanis, they have made human beings out of us. All too often, uh, we hear, read of crusades, of war between faiths, the clash of civilizations. The counterweight to such negativism, I found in an observation by the former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, the late John, Dr. Jonathan Sachs. In his book, 
the dignity of difference, how to avoid the clash of civilizations, he wrote, the test of faith is whether I can make space for difference. Can I recognize God's image in someone who is not in my image, whose language, faith, ideals are different from mine? If I cannot, then I've made God in my image instead of allowing him to remake me in his. Many religions have made their gods in their own image. Some have made man in God's image. For whatever your belief, we're all creatures of the same God. Because there is no religion I know of that exhorts you not to love one another. Could there be a nobler commemoration of Dr. Foreman's life purpose than to reaffirm today on the occasion of his 200th birth anniversary, the college's motto, which has been said before, and I repeat, by love, serve one another. Let me conclude by thanking all of the participants, the presenters, as well as the discussants, Dr. Yakub Bangash, Dr. Farzan Masi, Dr. Arfa Sayyid Azera, Dr. Sikandar Hayat, Professor Tahir Masood, and Dr. Jonathan Adelton. It's his sagacity and it is his feel for history that has brought all of us together here today. And I'd like to pay tribute and wish him all success in his onerous, but I'm sure exciting assignment as the rector of FCC University. Thank you very much indeed, everyone, for being part of this important milestone in the history of FCC. Thank you.